I was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1826. My mother's father was Noah Webster of the dictionary fame, and my best friend and first cousin was Olivia Day. In 1849, Olivia took a position teaching high school in Hartford. We wrote to each other every day and shared everything. <laughs> Actually, it was through Olivia's letters that I first learned about Thomas Kennecott Beecher <laughs> because he was the principal at her school. After a year teaching there, Olivia submitted her resignation, but Mr. Beecher would not accept it. He pulled her aside and proposed marriage. <laughs> After their year's engagement and their lovely wedding, they took up housekeeping in Brooklyn, New York, because Mr. Beecher had a new job being minister at the New England Congregational Church. Thomas preached to his congregation about the suffering of the poor and how to help, but his parishioners were up and comers and they were more interested in the ostentatious display of their own wealth than in doing God's work. <laughs> Olivia became ill early in her pregnancy. And because she was slight of frame, Thomas and I were both very concerned. She died in August of 1853, just two months shy of their second wedding anniversary. Oh, this personal loss threw Thomas into a deep despair. And that, coupled with the contentious nature of the relationships he had at his church, oh my heavens, on one particularly rancorous meeting, Thomas got so angry, he stood up from the table and walked out the door <laughs> and ran smack into a Mr. J. M. Robinson of Elmira, New York, who had come to Brooklyn to meet this Beecher, <laughs> younger brother of the more famous Henry Ward Beecher. Olivia and I both treasured Thomas, so it should come as no surprise to you that after Thomas had had enough time to recover from his depression and had secured a new pulpit in Elmira, New York, that I would say yes to him when he proposed marriage to me. <laughs> I was 31 at the time, which in those days was quite an age to be a blushing bride. <laughs> We lived at Beecher Cottage, right across from the Gleason Water Cure, on the road up from the city to East Hill. We enjoyed wonderful friendships with the doctors, Rachel and Silas Gleason, and Rachel and John W. Jones, and of course, Olivia and Jervis Langdon, and their eldest daughter, Susan, and her husband, Theodore Crane. <laughs> We never had any children of our own, but we adopted three and we fostered many over the years in Elmira. <sighs> Thomas Beecher was not your ordinary preacher. <laughs> Actually, he wanted to be called teacher at the Park Church and sometimes was not even recognizable as a minister. What with those overalls that he would wear and riding around on that oversized tricycle with his work tools, <laughs> he would no sooner help you hang a door, dig a well. <laughs> he kept the city clock on time by taking noon sun sightings with his own transit. <laughs> and you probably heard how he <laughs> introduced me one time when someone inquired about his health. Well, as well as could be expected when one is hitched to a steam engine. <laughs> really, as for me, I bobbed my hair in 1855. I wore Congress shoes with flat heels. <laughs> and I was known to swoop into other people's parlors and try to eliminate Victorian clutter. I taught Sunday school for 40 years at the Park Church, but even to this day, I cannot memorize a Bible verse to save my life. <laughs> Thomas Beecher took the traditional patriarchal 
manner of the Christian church and turned it upside down on its ear when he designed the Park Church in 1874 to be big enough <laughs> to serve and to feed and to care for all of his greater Elmira family. <laughs> I think about those days now when I look up into his bronze face in Wisner Park, how well the city showcased his ministry there by placing him with his back to the church, <laughs> looking out and lovingly reaching towards his beloved Elmira. Thomas officiated and I witnessed the marriage of Olivia Louise Langdon and Samuel Langhorn Clemens on that frigid February day in 1870. <laughs> we just had to walk across the street from the church to the sumptuous Langdon mansion for the ceremony. <laughs> and the very next day, I joined a group of family and friends on an excursion by train to Buffalo because we wanted to be there to wish the newlyweds well as they stepped into their new life together. But actually, it was a fully orchestrated hoodwink on Sam Clemens. <laughs> you see, Jervis Langdon had secretly purchased and fully equipped and set up a beautiful house at 472 Delaware Avenue in Buffalo for his daughter and his new son-in-law. We were all inside the house looking out the windows <laughs> at Sam Clemens fit to be tied trying to get Libby to divulge why they were stopping there <laughs> once they were inside. Jervis released his secret and he handed Clemens the deed to the property. And that is the only time I ever saw Mark Twain speechless. <laughs> the Beecher family was very famous before I even joined it. But I added a little bit to it with my Beecher babies. <laughs> Originally, we called them missionary rag babies, and they were made by the women of the Park Church to benefit missionary work. We made 900 dolls and over a thousand dollars. Another one of my artistic endeavors caught Mr. Clemens's eye. And, well, you see, I used to collect interesting looking roots and vines and leaves when I did my little walkabouts. And I would manage to put them together into assemblages and sometimes they looked like beasts or birds when they were finished. Mr. Clemens named them Jabberwocks <laughs> after the famous poem by Lewis Carroll. One day, from Hartford, I received this epistle. <laughs> Mrs. Beecher, he said, I have arranged your jabberwocks in procession on the piano in the drawing room. <laughs> and in that subtle light, they take on added, they take to themselves added atrocities of form and expression. <laughs> and so to make a body's flesh crawl, with pleasure. <laughs> Make more, he said. Leave no root in all of Shimon County unutilized. <laughs> but do not breathe the breath of life into them. For if I know anything about general appearance and physiognomy, <laughs> every one of them would vote the Democratic ticket. Every devil one of them. <laughs> Signed, S.C. Oh. Gracious. It was in 1895, here on the porch at Quarry Farm, that Clemens told us about his plans for a worldwide lecture tour <sighs> to raise needed funds. I had, he was as depressed as I had ever seen him about financial matters. I, of course, carried on in my traditional optimistic manner, talking about my faith in humanity and life everlasting. Well, I think I annoyed Mr. Clemens. <sighs> but I just wanted to help. 
So I said, now, Mr. Clemens, if you and I meet in heaven a million years from now, will you admit that you were wrong? <laughs> he demurred, but I wanted proof. I wanted a contract, <laughs> signed, sealed, and delivered to that effect. So I picked up a few flat stones and I gave them to him with my expressed desire. And this is what I got back. <laughs> it said right here, contract Mark Twain with Mrs. Thomas K. Beecher, Elmira, New York, July 2nd, 1895. <laughs> Number one, if you prove right and I prove wrong a million years from now, in language plain and frank and strong, my error I'll advow to your dear mocking face. <laughs> Number two, if I prove right, and by God's his grace, full sorry I shall be, for in that solitude, no trace there'll be of you or me, nor of our vanished race. And number three, <laughs> a million years. Oh, patient stone, you've waited for the message. Deliver it in a million years. Survivor pays expressage. That's all. <laughs>